up, we have with us a pair of presenters. So, we have Ms. Rebecca Yeo, who is a lead educational therapist and a pro programs manager of the MEDS team. She has more than five years of experience in teaching literacy and mathematics to students with dyslexia. She has contributed to the development of the essential math and advanced math curricula, as well as the training of new math dual specialists. Furthermore, she has conducted students' workshops, teacher sharing sessions, and talks with parents to provide them with strategies to help their children with mathematics. Rebecca has presented at both regional and local conferences. Together with her, we have Ms. Siti Aisha Shukri. She is a senior educational therapist and has been teaching children with specific learning differences in DAS for over nine years. She provides small group intervention in math as well as literacy. She is part of the curriculum development for the math program as well as the training of new math dual specialist in DAS. She has conducted talks and workshops for students and parents locally and internationally. Her works include research of the math programs in DAS. Her teaching philosophy is to teach a child the way he or she learns best. Rebecca and Siti Aisha will be speaking about the difficulties in expressing numbers in word, a study on grade 4 students with dyslexia in Singapore. So let us put our hands together to welcome our speakers. Hello, good morning everyone. <laughs> Thank you for giving us this opportunity to share our research with both of you, uh, with all of you. Um, so as... Um, uh, our colleague Ashikin has uh, introduced us. Uh, we are part of the MEDS uh, team in the DAS, and uh, we, are, we will be sharing with you our research on uh, difficulties that primary four students with dyslexia in Singapore face when they have to write numbers in words. Okay, so numbers are the basic building blocks of numeracy or mathematics, right? We see them in everyday life. We need them for multiple purposes. Right, uh, to name uh, things, for example, to tell the time, or even to write amounts. So for many people, um, uh, talking about numbers or communicating numbers to uh, other people seems like a very uh, normal routine task that we do on a daily basis, and it seems very simple. But what about people who have um, language difficulties such as dyslexia? Uh, what are the difficulties they uh, face when they have to do such an activity. Uh, we know fr from research that people with dyslexia have difficulties with mapping the units of sound in the language with how the symbolic representation looks like. And uh, we propose in this research that perhaps they would also have difficulties when they encounter tasks like these. So why is it important for us to study this? That's because um, besides the the practical applications of it. We also see that in school exam papers, this is one item that always comes up. Okay, And um, to help us investigate what are the difficulties that the students face, we also went into the research to look at what are the models that, are in, uh, that study um, how students or how people in general read numbers. So there are four theories that I would like to share with you. And these models would help us to um, get a glimpse of how people actually process numbers. The first model is the triple code model, which is developed by uh, Professor Dennis uh, Dehan. Uh, he's a, he's uh, an expert in uh, brain research, and he has studied how uh, the brain processes uh, language as well as uh, mathematics. Okay, the second model is by McCloskey, um, and uh, it actually um, is a carry-on from the triple cop model. And then we'll, we'll talk about uh, two other models that um, uh, divert from um, the original uh, triple cop model. Okay, so uh, the research is actually uh, divided. Sorry, the, the main um, research literature on this is actually divided according to the number of routes our brain takes when we process number and whether the meaning of a number 
needs to be uh, processed when we try to read a number. Okay? So the first model, the triple code model, suggests that there are three ways in which numbers can be coded. So we are very familiar with the visual Arabic code, which is the way we usually write our numbers, right? Um, the verbal number code is basically the way that we read numbers, okay? And um, if it's in English, then of course, that symbol that you see on the top will be read as three, okay? There's also another way to represent numbers, and that is to use the analog magnitude representation. So this is what they call a non-symbolic representation, and basically it's just how you would see quantities in day-to-day -day life. Okay? So according to uh, Professor Dennis, uh, Stanis' work, he found that there are three separate pathways that are involved when you want to translate numbers from one particular representation to another. And he studied this by looking at the brain scans of people who have uh, gone through traumatic brain injury. He found that um, if uh, the person is... No, he noticed that some people who um, are able to read the symbolic representation accurately, uh, sometimes they are not able to um, estimate accurately what that number is. Uh, whereas if you take the opposite route, like uh, when they are able to estimate what that number is, sometimes they cannot say out what that number is exactly. Okay, and so he suggests that there are specific areas of the brain uh, that are responsible for processing the numbers in the three different forms, and they are all separate from each other. And therefore with that, uh, the meaning of numbers need not uh, be processed as we try to read an Arabic code. Okay? Uh, the second model is the McCloskey's number reading model. And to help us understand this model, I would like you to try and read this number out for me. Can you do that? Okay, all of you are trying to read it as if it's a 4D lottery number. <laughs> I'd like you to read it as if it's a quantity. Can you do that one more time for me? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, although that wasn't neat, what I heard was 5,714,901, right? So how, how we are able to do it is that uh, um, McCloskey suggests that our brain actually creates a synthetic, uh, sorry, uh, a meaningful frame to organize the digits into their place values, right? And how we are able to do this is because we all well, all of us have actually gone through schooling and we've been taught that our numbers are organized in a base 10 system. And therefore, what happens to your brain is that we, we don't really see this, but the brain organizes each digit into their place values like that. Okay, pardon the very slow animation. <laughs> okay, and because it organizes it like that, we are able to tell what each digit stands for. Okay, other than just reading it in digits. Uh, and so he, suggest, he suggests that uh, the brain processes the irregularities of the center structure and uses it as a guide by using the place values, right, so that we are able to retrieve the appropriate uh, phonological codes for reading the number. Now the next model I'm going to talk to you about deviates from the single root uh, model which talks, uh, which says that oh, you can only process the numbers in one way, which is from the Arabic code to um, the verbal code, and and that's it. It would not, it would not go into the meaningful frame. Okay, so this multi-root model actually suggests that there is more than one way uh, that numbers are processed, and it happens concurrently. Okay. So whether the number is processed for its meaning or not, it depends on the demands of the task. So if our numbers are small enough, we would be able to process what that symbol represents, right? the meaning of that symbol, and we'll be able to produce uh, how it's supposed to be read. Whereas if the numbers are too big, then we might just process it uh, in the way that it's supposed to be read, but we do not have a, a true understanding of what that number represents. Okay, uh, and so it's in like a turn off, turn on, uh, turn on, turn off mode. 
So if one pathway is activated, the other is not. Okay? So this is a pictorial representation of how it looks like. Uh, so for small numbers, what it does is that if we are looking at a number and trying to say it in words, it will go through pathway A, right? And it will go into uh, the top system, which uh, processes it for its meaning before you come down to read what that number is, okay? But for bigger numbers, then it will just go through the asymmetric processing where you just transcode immediately and then you get the output without meaning. Now, the last model I'm going to talk about is the connectionist model. Uh, and this model basically suggests that people can learn to read numbers through extensive practice uh, and by receiving feedback on uh, their responses. So again, they, they agree that there are two ways uh, in which we read numbers. And one is uh, with meaning, the other is without meaning. Okay? Uh, this model actually extends the multi-root model that we saw just now by saying that for small numbers, there are actually uh, connection nodes uh, in your brain for each of these numbers. And so if you use the numbers frequently enough, the numbers will be activated more uh, uh, the connection will be stronger and it will be, e uh, be easy for you to retrieve the numbers as compared to bigger numbers. Okay? And so our current research aims to identify what kind of difficulties our students, uh, our primary four students with dyslexia, have when they have to express uh, numbers in words. Okay? Um, and this is the research question that we aim to answer. Uh, we hypothesize that because of the difficulties students with dyslexia have, uh, that they would produce spelling errors when they are trying to spell number words. Uh, and because of the low frequency of uh, five-digit numbers in uh, daily lives, right, in accordance with the connectionist model, um, participants will also experience greater difficulty in organizing the numbers according to their appropriate syntax. And therefore, we would see more errors when it comes to uh, them writing the numbers uh, correctly in words. Okay, so I'll pass the time over to Aisha, who will share with you more about the methodology we took. Thank you. Um, okay, moving on. So for this research, um, what we have done is actually we had 34 primary four students from our program. Now, half of which are male and half of them are actually female. Now, all of them have a diagnosis with dyslexia and we actually handpicked them. These are students who have been with us for more than six months. Um, all of them except one were attending or are attending still DS literacy program. To give you a, a short background of what the S literacy program is, um, the program actually covers five components. So we actually do phonics and phonics awareness with them. Uh, we have um, vocabulary and oracy, and we also do grammar, writing, as well as comprehension. Okay. Now, this uh, very uh, this exploratory study that we're doing right now, or I'm presenting to you, was actually part of a larger research that we did to measure um, the progress the student makes annually uh, from being our program. Uh, the reason why we decide to do this is because we actually observe that our students um, mainly they have they start to have difficulties at primary four level when they do numbers that are beyond more than three digits. So they were doing quite well actually, up to three digits, and when they have to say numbers that are thousands, suddenly, you know, they, they can't even imagine there's a thousand, uh, there's number beyond hundreds. So that's also the reason um, why we're doing this. Um, so how do we do it is that the students actually took a traditional pen and, paper, pen and pencil test, um, to assess the knowledge of whole number concept only. And, but these are the concepts that are acquired uh, at the P4 level or required for them to know at the beginning of the year at primary 4 level. The concepts include writing five digit numbers in numerals and in words, um, the place value, and comparing and ordering of numbers as well as rounding off. For this particular study, we will zoom in to the specific test item to examine the types of errors the participants made. 
So um, as you can see, this number was chosen for a few reasons. All right, number one is a mix of phonetically regular words and sight words, so it's not very difficult. Um, it's less irregularity in the structure, uh, simply meaning that it's more regular in the structure as compared if you have a number with a zero in, in, in it. So uh, for example, if you have 27,048, there's a certain place value that is not mentioned. So it, it's actually more difficult, okay? So when we gather all the data, this is how we analyze the results. There were three researchers who were involved and we actually mark the participant scripts and record the scores. Now, student responses were given one mark for correct responses and half mark were deducted for any error that was made. Of course, if it's totally wrong, then it will get a zero, okay? All right, so the students' responses were analyzed for their errors. And these are the results, okay? So out of the, all the participants, only 29.4% actually got this item correct. Um, that's actually less than 50%, right? So about 10 of them. And we, we observed that there's a total of 51 errors that were made. And the common, most common type of errors made by the participants were actually spelling errors and followed by punctuation errors and syntactical errors. Now these categories uh, were, were came up from at least two of us actually have to agree on the grouping for the error before the error was labeled. So as you can see, we categorize them into the three different groups, spelling errors, punctuation, as well as synthetical. Okay, so moving on to the one, uh, the first error, spelling errors, we further classify them into two um, groups, look-alike errors as well as sound-alike errors. Now, what are look-alike errors? Uh, they are actually basically, they look similar, uh, to how the word is supposed to be spelled, but if you try to read them phonetically, they, you can't even read them, okay? And the other one, like for example, this word, you can't pronounce that right, so verven, okay? And the other error is actually they sound alike because they are phonetically similar, but they are still wrong. So even though they spell as a S A V N, you can just pronounce as seven, almost close to seven. So most of the words that students spelled wrongly were actually side words as seven and thousands, okay? Uh, phonetically regular words as 40 and 20 were also frequently misspelled with more variations in the spelling. Now we notice that student spelling strategies consist of phonics and spelling by sight, but most of the attempts resulted in more look-alike errors than sound-alike errors. Now what does this show? This shows that, you know, um, they, they are learning phonics in our program, but are they applying it cross subjects? Maybe not, because they're not applying their phonics knowledge effectively to spell the word. And we're relying more from their sight memory. So they kind of figure out oh, this is how the word looks like and they just you know, try to spell it. Okay, the next error will be punctuation errors. There were om uh, omissions of hyphen as a commas uh, for the numbers, okay? So it's, they don't really break up the sentences structure into its constituent parts. Now, although these errors do not affect the meaning of the whole number, but we also consider them very important. Uh, why is this so? Because it is required of the students in the local education system where actually it's more stricter, right? If you get it wrong, that's zero totally, okay? So without any commas, uh, hyphens, uh, uh, connectors as N, that question, you will get it wrong, okay? So under the syntax errors, we have the type one and type two, inappropriate use of connector N. So if you can look here, there's some mistakes, right? The first one, of course, they're missing the hyphen, okay? And then uh, it's 940 and eight, okay? Versus 948. So the N connector is actually put in the wrong place, okay? Um, but it doesn't really change the overall meaning. You can roughly gauge what the student is trying to say. Okay? Type 2 errors uh, will affect the overall meaning of the numbers. For example, if you omit out the word thousands, okay, it, has, it holds no meaning at all. You, you have no idea where the 27 is at the place value. All right? okay. So I will pass it back to Rebecca where she will actually explain on the discussion as well as the future research. Hello. Okay, great. 
Um, yeah, so now I, I will discuss, uh, no, I will share with you what um, the results mean. So if we go back to the beginning of our sharing, we started off with sharing with you the hypothesis of the, the study, right? And we said that we expected students with dyslexia to make spelling errors when they are supposed to spell number words. And we find that this, uh, this finding to be true, right? The spelling errors were found to be the most common source of students' errors. And therefore, it tells us that there needs to be, um, that there is a need to incorporate spelling and language uh, features into uh, math lessons as well. Okay, so what teachers can do is to introduce literacy explicitly into math to show students the relationship between the English language and how it's also being used in math. Right? Um, the presence of the look-alike and sound-alike errors also points to the need to teach things like spelling in maths lessons. Uh, and there needs to be explicit teaching of how number words are supposed to be spelt. Another thing we notice is that while phonics is usually the highly recommended approach to learn spelling, right, there are many words in the English language that cannot be, um, be spelt using phonics rules. And students sometimes are very confused as to when they should use phonics to spell and when they shouldn't. And therefore, teachers need to guide the, their students um, to know when to use phonics and when not to. Uh, and for, for the learning of sight words, teachers will need to use alternative uh, strategies, such like the look, see, sorry, look, cover, look, cover spell, check uh, strategy to teach such words. The second observation we found was that many students were able to produce the correct sentence structure for the five-digit numbers, even though their responses were missing the appropriate punctuation. And this is surprising to us because it is inconsistent with the, um, with the theory that we had shown earlier that uh, the number words have to be frequent enough for students to get the, uh, the structure. Okay, uh, and it also shows us that uh, students um, are more concerned about uh, producing the correct sentence structure that they miss out other, uh, other features that they find are super superficial, things like the commas and the use of the end. Okay, um, yeah, so teachers will need to help students to make the link between how the number is written in the Arabic numeral form versus how it would look like in the word form. Because there are similarities, but they are not uh, obvious enough for the students to pick up on these similarities. Okay. Uh, it also shows that uh, synthetic processing was involved in transcoding big numbers. Right? And uh, this is supported by the fact that the, the digits uh, in the number were actually transcoded correctly based on what the digits say rather than what it represented. Um, yeah. So the omission of the place value words uh, in students' responses hints that perhaps uh, the processing of big number words is asymmetric. That means it is not meaningful, and students are just looking at the digits and just uh, transcoding them according to the digits. Our last observation is that the omission of uh, the commas as well as um, things like the connector n shows that students are not aware or they are not sensitive to how number words are supposed to be passed. Okay, passing is basically a very technical term that means breaking down a, a phrase or a sentence into its parts. Now let's compare this with the English language. When we give you, uh, when people uh, say sentences or when they read out sentences, they are usually able to break down that sentence into the different parts of speech involved in that sentence. So for example, if I say the dog ran, right, you know that the dog is the subject, whereas ran is the action, right? Uh, but this is not so straightforward when it comes to number words. And that's because each word in the number uh, sentence could represent either a value or a place or a digit. Okay, and, and therefore this is very confusing for our students. So what teachers need to do is to model explicitly to students how to break down number words into their various parts. And uh, to do so, you might want to refer to a place value chart or to use a visual, um, uh, a visual representation, which we will show you uh, in the next slide. 
Okay, so chunking is another explicit, uh, another skill that teachers will need to demonstrate explicitly. So I'm what I'm showing you now is a visual representation of how the number will look like in numerals and how the word representations actually mirror how they look like in uh, the numerical form. Okay, so take for example this number. I've already placed them according to their place values. Uh, in words, this number would read um, 12. So you would see that I would chunk, sorry, I would chunk the digits in groups of three. Okay, and so when we read the numbers, we can use the groups of three to help us uh, transcode the number. So the first two number on the left would read 12 million. You will notice that there's a space between uh, that chunk and the next chunk of three. That spacing is meant for the comma. Okay, then you can continue with the next chunk of three. So the next chunk of three digits would say 305 but they represent the thousands. So it's 305,000, followed by another comma, and then finally 647. Okay? All right, I'm coming to the end of the presentation soon. We'll just like to share some limitations of the current study. First of all, the study that we've, uh, our, our findings so far are based on one item. And you can see that although there's a lot of information that we've gathered from both qualitative and quantitative analysis, it is not enough for us to analyze how students code on a more general basis. Uh, it would be good if we could have uh, replicated the study uh, or would replicate the study in future by having more uh, items uh, where there are a variety of numbers ranging maybe from two digits to five digits and see how students perform uh, when they are asked to transcode uh, the numbers from Arabic numeral form to words. And it would be good if we could have more items uh, in order to secure reliability. The second limitation is that spelling might also uh, mediate their ability to spell, to express the numbers in words. And therefore, to control for this, it would be good if we could have an additional test to test the ability to read the numbers orally and compare that with how they would perform if they are asked to write the numbers in words. Lastly, areas of future research, we have three. First is to investigate the kinds of errors they will make in the opposite process. That means that when we give them the numbers in words, how they would be able to transcode them into numerals. <clears throat> and it will be interesting to see if there's a relationship between these two uh, opposite processes. Finally, uh, this research has been contained to students who have dyslexia. And it will be very interesting if you could see how students with other language difficulties, such as uh, speech and language impairment, or now it's called uh, DLD, <laughs> uh, would perform on tasks like these. Okay. Uh, with that, thank you for your kind attention. We've come to the end.